and welcome to PBCJ Presents, our weekly discussion series in which we examine some of the hot button issues of the day. I am Simone Absalom Gale. This week, our focus is on tourism. Over the years, tourism has become one of the main drivers of foreign exchange for the country, boasting of 3.64 billion US dollars and 4.3 million visitors in 2019. But with the onset of COVID, tourism was brought to its knees, losing billions. The sector suffered from a staggering loss of jobs and closure of businesses. Fast forward to 2022. Tourism is once again leading the country's recovery, expecting to earn at the close of 2022 3.3 billion US dollars. Joining us in studio today to explain the importance of tourism and the thrust by the government to get the sector back up and fully functioning is Minister of Tourism, Edmund Bartlett. Welcome, Minister. Thank you very much, Simone. All right, right off the bat, let's start with the big question. After COVID, why is the focus still so heavy on tourism? And we saw what could happen if a pandemic hits. Well, first of all, you know, it's funny. This is just today. We were looking at how pervasive uh, the industry is across the island. And, um, and I note that the entire stretch from the west, northwest, all the way to east, northeast, is all tourism. All the communities and all the key workers are in tourism. So the emphasis is not misplaced because it is the basis on which uh, more than a third of the working population is predicated. So tourism also is the fastest industry to rebound after global disruptions. As we are seeing, even now, that uh, the recession that is even coming, uh, the pandemic, which is still going, tourism is still growing, and growing in every single source market destination. Jamaica leads the growth in the English-speaking Caribbean, and we are second in the entire Caribbean area, second behind the Dominican Republic. So what we're saying is that the instant convertibility properties of tourism, that is to say, immediately as the plane flies, the dollar rolls. As the ship comes into the port with the cruise, the dollar rolls. And it goes directly in the pockets of the ordinary Jamaican. Just go to the airport and you'll see, you know, just go into Ocho Reyes, into Montego Bay, and any of our main towns and you'll see. As the tourist moves in the area, the dollar moves with them. So we know uh, also that tourism has the highest propensity to consume of all the industries of the world. So 42% of the expenditure of a visitor is on food, for example. And they consume everything. They consume your transport, they consume your attractions, they consume your energy, they consume you know, the experience is all around. And that's all tourists do. They just consume. And so building products for consumption is everything. And what do they consume? Everything. That's so true. tourism is that catalyst that enables a quick recovery of all the economic activities in a country. And that's why it's preferred as the, the industry sector. for recovery. That's true. But also, though, once there is a major threat to the country, the first thing you're going to do is, in most cases, not all, shut down the border, which is what happened when COVID-19 hit. So what were your primary concerns when you saw that that was going to happen? Well, to begin with, uh, Jamaica has built a resilience based on our knowledge, first of all, that tourism is a uh, highly susceptible industry to disruptions. And we've seen it. In the last 50 years, we've had 10 mega disruptions, which we call the black swans, that have affected how people travel and how um, source markets have been able to operate. Um, you know, some of them you know. We've had SARS. It's not the first SARS. This is just the worst. We've had the 9-11 incident in New York, you know, when the Twin Towers went to terrorism. Um, we've had economic downturns, like in 2008. Uh, you know, we've had Ebola and a number of other um, 
epidemics, pandemics, chicken, gunia, you name it. So all of these have affected how people travel, where to go, when they go, and the level of economic activity around it. But in all instances, when recovery comes, tourism not just grow, but grow exponentially. So that up to 2019, after the 10 disruptions, tourism was the fastest growing industry on earth, accounting for 11% of global GDP and employing 10.5% of everyone who is working on planet earth. So when you consider that and you recognize that consumption is such a huge part of it and food is such a critical part of it, Jamaica with its enormously popular cuisine and with its ability to drive experiences that are at another level of appreciation and acceptance, had to stand in a good position to benefit from it. And we are. That's true. That's true. All right. We're going to take a quick break. We've been discussing tourism, the sector, its resilience, the lessons that we've learned when it comes to recovering from a pandemic and all of those things that he just stated. Stay with us. We'll be right back. I wish to inform Jamaica that the government has already launched Operation Get Every Illegal Gun. My message today, therefore, is directed to the many young men who have illegal weapons in their possession, who hide the weapons, or as they say, lock them. And I'm speaking as well to the girlfriends, the baby mothers, the sisters and the mothers, who give them cover and protection. I'm giving you warning. Put down the gun. Give it up. Leave the gang. Disassociate dissociate yourself from the gunmen. Otherwise, the consequences will be grim. Welcome back to PBCJ Presents. We're talking about the tourism sector and we have the minister himself with us, Minister Edmund Bartlett. We were talking about what happened when the pandemic hit, and some of the concerns and things that you had to think about when you're yeah. thinking about how to survive and how to recover. Yeah. Now, what were some of the lessons learned yeah. from well, this just, experience? Just to go back for half a second mm -hmm. to indicate that the resilience I spoke about was mm -hmm. born out of a sense of knowing mm -hmm. that the disruptions that we face must be met with action mm -hmm. um, and to develop a whole series of what we call mitigating factors. So the first thing we did when the world started talking about uh, what was not yet a pandemic, the um, SARS, uh, COVID-19, that came out of Wuhan in, in, in China, January of 2020, we established a crisis management task force in tourism because we recognized that this was a potential threat. And then we started to look at you know, how do we look at market arrangements and demographics and psychographic profiles and so on to see how to market differently and also how to look at product mixes that will be able to respond to that. So by March 2020, when the World Health Organization declared the global pandemic, we were ready to establish a recovery task force, which we did. And that recovery task force began with some technical support from the consultants that we brought in from Pricewaterhouse and working with our tourism development company and the Jamaica Hotel and Tourist Association mm -hmm. uh, in partnership with the Ministry of Health, we developed quickly a set of protocols based on the science, what it was saying and data, uh, which was some 385 pages. And uh, immediately the World Travel and Tourism uh, Council recognized what Jamaica was doing and gave us the seal of safe travel. So initially, we were able to establish that we understood what were the mitigating factors to be brought to bear to help to manage this process. We went further to train the workers who were now on forlorn. 20,000 of them we trained um, virtually 
uh, and gave them certification. Then we went to invest in public, in sorry, uh, personal private equipment, the PPEs that yes. we talk about, right? So that um, the workers and others could have the masks and have the sanitization programs that were required, plus the equipment. We went and we gave away to small and medium tourism enterprises. I remember myself going to the border of St. Elizabeth and Westmoreland to hand out sanitization equipment to the fisher folks there and all around. And then we develop a program now of certification of the tourism entities. So we declared that these entities were COVID appropriate. That is to say, they had complied with the requirements of having social distancing, ensuring yes, that Yes, I remember that. And then you had the resilience block. Well, we're which coming I to was that, we're calling idea. it block, not a block. <laughs> and then we established the resilience corridor. Corridor, corridor, yes, right? I remember which that. Which was that geographical area from east to west to the island, which essentially covered about 85% of brilliant. all our touristic assets. And within that area, everyone had to be fully COVID compliant. And they wore decals. We put stickers onto each of these um, entities so that when the visitor comes and anybody else comes, they see that they are COVID compliant. And the result of all of that was we had within that corridor less than 1% infection level. And that was humongous. That attracted the attention of the world. And the Jamaican model was adopted by a number of other areas. So the government of Jamaica with their um, pre-authorization platform, Jam COVID, provided also the basis of screening to ensure that people were coming to the country who were less likely to be transmitting um, the virus and also less likely to be getting um, infected. So all of that was part of what Jamaica did as a country to ensure that we were managing the pandemic well, but more importantly, that we had established confidence in the marketplace, that people knew that if you came to Jamaica, you would have a safe, secure, and seamless experience. Let's fast forward to Resilience Day. What's the, the idea behind that? Good. So tourism has shown to be resilient, but resilience is what the world requires now to deal with the future shocks. And we're going to have more shocks. I mean, we just had to encounter with something called monkeypox, which is now a new uh, variation of the... Um, smallpox. Well, of smallpox, yes. But it's a variation of the, um, of the health you know, issues that you have to deal with. Um, and then we have the, the war in Ukraine, which is another disruption. Um, and we're going to have more. Cyber crimes is raging in many places. No, that's a disruption. Um, and then there are political upheavals and, 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 and so on. And now we're going to be facing economic disruption as a result of the hyperinflation, which is now resulting from the huge demand and supply issue that the COVID has brought on. So these are things that you have to manage. So what resilience building does is to give you the capacity to, first of all, foresee what's coming, then to mitigate against it, then to manage it when it hits you, and to recover, and recover quickly, and then to thrive. So establishing a resilience day is to say to the world, let's focus on the things we now need to do to manage the next wave of disruptions that are going to come. Let us look at how to build capacity. Let us train our people more to understand um, disruptions, what they are, and how to deal with it. Let's use technology to create tools that are going to help us to, to manage it better. And most important, let's develop a mindset of innovation, you know, and being able to pivot and change and adapt quickly to manage the circumstances. So it's an enormously powerful position. And I think Jamaica has been the driver of this. We are the thought leaders in resilience worldwide. If you Google resilience and so Jamaica comes up a million times because we are the drivers of this and particularly for tourism resilience Jamaica is the one that came up with the whole idea of the resilience day and had the UN and other agencies endorsing it and um, the 17th of February every year 
as of next year. And we're going to have a big observation here in Jamaica, as well as other places of the world, when we will focus on resilience building. I want to say something else about resilience, because Jamaica didn't just come up with the idea of the tourism resilience, but we created an academic center at the University of the West Indies. The first global tourism resilience and crisis management center we established here. And from that, we've established six others across the world. In Kenya, at the Kenyatta University. In Jordan, at the Middle Eastern University. In um, Canada, at George Brown College. Mm -hmm. In London, at the Beaumont University. Mm -hmm. And now FIU is about to, to get there. as a name, Sophia, in Bulgaria. That um, is about to Minister, to you've been so, working. You've been working hard with your team, but I want to take a quick break, and we're going to come right back. We're going to be talking more about your leading role in this era of resilience, because we're still in an era where we need to be able to bounce back from all of these uh, disruptives, as you call them. Stay with us. PBCJ presents. We'll be right back. <music> Welcome back to PBCJ Presents. I'm your host, Simone Absalom Gale, and we're talking about tourism. And we have the Minister of Tourism with us, Mr. Edwin Bartlett. He's still in studio. We're talking about resilience. And talking about that, you added author to your name in recent times. Uh, tell us about that book. And it has a long title. Let me read it out for you. Tourism Resilience, Recovery and Sustainability for Global Development, Navigating COVID-19 and the Future. Yes. Actually, that was a statement of what we call academic essays yes. with a emphasis on a practical response. And the practical response was Jamaica's example. And I actually wrote that chapter, uh, which gave a chronology of our action activities uh, as we navigated uh, COVID and managed to get growth, and as you correctly said at the beginning, to lead the recovery of the economy. So the book essentially is a scholarly piece that is going to find its place in you know, universities and colleges and institutions of learning because it's about that. It's about people uh, learning more about how to deal, not just with the pandemic, but with disruptions in general, because we're going to have more. It's, it's Anthropocene Earth has been rife with disruptions. I mean, they have been many, and they cover the years of the centuries. And there will be more. So man's ability to continue to sustain on planet Earth is a function of resilience. His ability to respond to these challenges, to overcome them, and to grow. And um, we have grown. So to learn more about how to do it is to give yourself the tools for survival. And of course, you have left for generations to come. It's a part of your legacy. They can learn from yeah. the work that yes. you put in when the country was facing dire, dire circumstances. Right. And just to point out very humbly that this is the first book of his, this nature since the pandemic. And um, it is appropriate that Jamaica should lead in that since we are the drivers of the tourism resilience movement in the world today. And continuing on that trend of resilience, we do have something that is putting a little stick in our movement, the issue of crime. How do you balance encouraging visitors to come to Jamaica, but have people worry about certain advisories that are put out, you know, from time to time about Jamaica? Right. So, so crime is one of the disruptions um, that you have to build, um, you know, the capacity to, to deal with and manage. And um, uh, Jamaica has struggled over the years with that. No question about it at all. And even now, that struggle continues. But in, the, in, in dealing with it, tourism has had the fortunate, I would say, experience of crime against visitors to be 
at a record low and an enviable low in global standards. So that less than 1% of the crimes that are committed are wrong are against your visitors. And that's a strong statement of confidence that visitors have in the safety of the destination. And that's why we have 42% repeat business. You know, that is to say, one in two of everybody who you see on the beach there has been to Jamaica at least once. And that's a big statement for a country like ours. That has helped us with um, travel advisories and other neg negative invectives that we get from time Let's to talk time. about regional plans now. In terms of regional tourism, how can we get our CARICOM brothers and sisters to come to Jamaica and spend? Yes. You know, the business of multi-destination tourism is top of our agenda. And we're driving that, too, as one of the thought leadership issues coming from Jamaica. And um, we want to have collaboration more with our Caribbean neighbors at the heart of the tourism possibilities is transportation. So access across borders is critical. So first thing we need to do is to fix that issue of regional transportation to enable uh, air services and also maritime services so we can move people and traffic and, and goods and services. And secondly, we need to look at the protocols that determine movement border control issues, visas, how do we uh, deal with the issue, for example, of creating um, a central uh, area with, where pre-clearance, for example, takes place, so that a flight comes into Jamaica and everybody is cleared, customs, immigration, so it becomes domestic to Trinidad, Barbados. I'm thinking so fees, though, because the amount of money I have to pay to go to, say, Barbados. Well, but this is the you point. Know, Once we fix the transportation issues, then the cost will be fixed because now we will have volume and the critical mass will enable uh, contribution from everybody to be less. So you will end up with lower rates all around with more people contributing to cover the costs. And that's an important consideration, but it, it has political uh, implications and value. And I think that if CARICOM were to mean anything to the region, it must be a vehicle for fixing that access problem. That's true. Connectivity. That's true. All right, you just came back from traveling abroad, various stops. Uh, you're looking to expand internationally. What's happening on that front? Well, the marketing for us is the, one of the drivers of resilience. Um, finding new markets, looking at where they are, uh, the new centers of economic influence are going to be, how power is distributed, and more importantly, connectivity. How, how do you find where there are uh, large, profitable uh, airlines operating uh, who have an appetite for long-haul travel? And the, 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 the place is the Middle East. There's no question about it. That's the center of wealth. That's where you have great gateways that connects with North Africa, connects with Asia. India, for example, is a, is a huge gateway to India. Um, China, as well as the Levant countries and um, the old Asia Minor, as we call it. So what we find is that moving through there gives us a reach that is beyond our traditional markets of North America and Western Europe. And if we're able to bring incrementally, you know, visitors in, it takes care of the fallout that you could have in your traditional market as a result of the economic disruptions that might be happening. So going to these new markets enable you to tap into new demographics, to tap into new psychographic profiles that enables us also to have investment in products that are attractive to those profiles. And, and this is why Jamaica grows, because we are always seeing what's new, what's different, what's attractive, and finding a way to add that to the richness of our experiences. Are you getting good feedback from those, those countries when you visit them? Well, I, I, I have something to say in Parliament shortly on that, <laughs> because um, you know we had good meetings 
with um, the largest airlines in the Middle East, Emirates, and we have good responses. So, so you know, as a matter of fact, no, just to let you know that um, they are now selling Jamaica. Um, we don't have the critical mass yet to allow for the A380s and the, you know, the 777s extended to fly into our space. But we are building that and what we were able to get is Emirates holidays to start selling Jamaica. So Jamaica now is inserted in their platform. So you want to go to Jamaica, you can buy a ticket from Emirates through a number of gateways, including Malpensa in Italy. So not just the American gateways now of um, New York and Orlando, you know, and Miami and Chicago and Boston and so on. But you can also come through Italy. And that's a good move for us because it means connectivity through Europe. Mm -hmm. So that engagement was very positive in terms of breaking um, the, 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 the ceiling. And, what about and, our and African enabling brothers? the so, access to I hear you say market. Middle East and everything, but we, we were talking about um, direct flights possibly uh, from Nigeria and Ghana. Yes, those, those are still on the cards. Africa is, a, in my mind, is a new oyster. It is um, a growing gateway possibility. Um, I'm talking now with teams about establishing a Caribbean-African summit, and that may very well happen on the 17th of February next year um, as part of the Resilience Day observation. Uh, when I go to Rwanda um, uh, next week, we'll be talking with a number of African uh, ministers about this. And already, um, the frame is set for the Caribbean-African connection because that is a, a double whammy. Because you know the diaspora we are? And then the reverse diaspora. Because we now can go invest in Africa, travel and have vacations there, and Africans can come here and do likewise. Speaking of investments, real quickly, we're running out of time. Coffee, in terms of getting that product out, using a tourism as a vehicle to improve the industry. What's happening on that? Well, front? huge possibilities. We, we're trying to ensure that everybody who comes to Jamaica gets a taste of Jamaican coffee. Um, it's premium coffee, as you know, and the production levels may not allow for us to have everybody getting the pristine Blue Mountain, but at least a blend. So we are trying over the next few years to, first of all, with the cruise, so that when you arrive at a cruise port, there is a coffee counter, you know, and there's possibility for you also to buy the grains and, um, and to also buy... Um, whatever variations and value added that may be from our coffee experience. And then certainly the hotels to be encouraged to serve Blue Mountain Coffee. It's a premium drink because everybody upsells. And as you upsell, you know, you give that premium. You know, it's a wedding or it's a honeymoon or it's an anniversary. And you have a special evening of high-end uh, dining and top wine and port and you have a blue mountain coffee the top brand in the, the world, brand in the world yes. is there anything else that you'd want to add to well, what i want to add is knowledge? that jamaica is at a very critical moment in terms of our recovery um, the impact of the global uh, recession which is looming uh, the hyper uh, inflation that the world is experiencing as a result of this crisis of demand and supply. It is forcing uh, a level of um, negative employment in some sectors. Not because you don't want to employ, but because the disruption has changed the dynamics in terms of your human capital and availability of workers in your area. And so Jamaica has to now grapple with a new reality that we're going to have to recover with greater efficiency so that our workers are going to have to pivot and be able to add value to their jobs because the numbers are not going to be there in the way that we want. And lastly, that portability in our labor force is a big item that we shouldn't ignore. 
and Jamaican demand for, uh, sorry, the world's demand for Jamaican workers is strong. We see that with the crews, we see that with the hospitality section in the U.S., we see that with the farm work. So all of that together has its strong points of creating foreign exchange for us on the one hand, giving our workers experience internationally on the other, but it also challenges our own local availability and productivity. So I wanted to raise that as something that we all have to work through and to make sure that in all of it, Jamaica's economic recovery is not in peril at all. It's always good news when you're talking about tourism. You've been watching PBCJ Presents. Our topic this week, tourism. Thanks to my special guest, the Minister of Tourism, Edmund Bartlett, we spoke about the country's resilience, how we got back from a dark, dark place and our plans for the future. You've been watching PBCJ Presents. Thanks for watching.